going to get started. Um, and thank you for coming out on this dreary day in Washington. Um, so first, I want to start off by thanking Ann Fisher from the Postal Regulatory Commission, who, who heads up the public affairs, um, for coming out today. Um, I'm Nick Zayas. I cover postal policy at the R Street Institute. Um, to my right, or to Ann's right, is Kevin Kozar, our Vice President for Policy at R Street, who studied postal policy for a long time before his career as a political scientist, or during his career as a political scientist. Um, this event was set up to give a little bit of an intro to, to postal policy for people who are not necessarily postal experts, who, are not, who don't do this for a living, or people who have to deal with this, with postal policy, on the level of getting constituent phone calls that are really angry about stuff that you don't really understand. Um, so the goal, with, goal today is to give a little bit of an overview of postal policy, present some resources, and, and hopefully you'll walk away a little bit easier, or with a little bit better of an understanding about how this government agency works. Um, at the end, we'll, we'll have plenty of time for questions that you might have. Um, so, to get things started, um, so I'm going to start with a few highlights from my piece, um, at, uh, USPS Policy at a Glance, that you guys all have on your chairs. Um, and I'm going to highlight a few of these kind of pieces that are really useful and I found useful for researching postal policy, getting postal questions answered really quickly. Um, so to start, well, it all goes, goes back to the money. Um, USPS Form 10K is the start and end of a lot of postal questions that you might have. A constituent calls and says, why is, he, why is the postal service doing X? Why are they spending money or wasting money in, in this way? Well, the answer is in the 10K. Um, it lists out, out the ways that USPS gets its money gets, and spends its money and and is a place that any person who is new to an office should really start to get a grasp of what the Postal Service does. Um, there are a whole bunch of other reports in, in Postal Policy. Uh, I'm going to highlight a few and, and pull out the one or two most important pieces of that. Um, the Postal Regulatory Commission's annual report, report is really useful for a whole bunch of reasons. The number one of those is it's the place where you get the answers about the world, the post offices, about delivery service, about what universal service is and the cost of it. Um, we all know that you get, the, get these angry, angry questions. The PRC annual report has a lot of those answers that you can't just get from a 10K. Um, there are a few other places out there that, with policy recommendations. Um, and the number one place for, for that right now is the President's Task Force on Postal Reform, um, further down in the sheet. That, and that lists the results of last year's study, the most recent study on how to reform USPS, what needs to be done, what could be done. Um, and then there, there are a couple of USPS reports that are really useful here. Um, first, USPS has, a, has strategic goals. Those strategic goals are in its are in its strategic plan, but also it needs to it needs to update Congress on what it's doing every year, and that's in in the annual report to Congress. That's in, it's important because not only do you get get an insight into what the USPS should be doing on paper, but it, what it thinks its big weaknesses are. It's the only really good source for where to get USPS thinking and mentality on a lot of these postal issues. Um, so I highly recommend the report to Congress as a as the way you get inside the agency without calling someone at USPS and asking questions. Um, so beyond that, what are, the, what are some other questions you might you might get from a constituent? I'm getting too much junk mail. Well, Kevin has a guide on that. Um, I want to kind of close my bit of uh, highlights and think and repeating the things that you can see on your sheet by pointing at Kevin's junk mail guide. It's useful for constituents. It's not something that you're going to get from USPS or the DRC. Um, they're not going to tell you how to reduce mail. Kevin told you how to reduce mail five years ago. Um, so I'm going to hand this over to Kevin, um, who's going to give you an over overview on the state of play with a USPS. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, hello, all. Before uh, going into my little spiel, uh, I want to first um, draw your attention to another think tanker in the room, another one of those rare birds who actually does postal and logistics policies in the back row there. It's 
Paul Steidler, the yellow tie on. Uh, he's over at the Lexington Institute. He's somebody who, if you have questions on postal issues, feel free to reach out to him in addition to uh, Nick, myself, and our, our little colleague friends at CRS. Um, Thank you, Kevin. Certainly. I, I work at Congressional Research Service for more than a decade on postal issues. Uh, where I stuck my nose into everything from constituent, constituent minutia, like how high do I need to install my curbside mailbox, what are the regulations on that, to big policy issues like the bazillion dollar pension and health uh, benefits policies. So feel free, uh, America's tax dollars at work, trained me for a decade to do postal policy. It was an investment the American people made in me, so please feel free to reach out to me with any questions. No matter how large or how small, email, tweet them at me, however you like. Now, today I just want to address two topics. The first of which is the Postal Service's very troubled finances. And the other is something that you're going to confront every day in your offices, which is postal politics. First, the finances. As the handout on your seat indicates, Postal Service finances are not healthy, they're actually quite bad. USPS was designed as a self-financing entity, uh, which since 1970, it has mostly done. It has gotten by. Um, but presently, it has more than $120 billion with a B, dollars in debt and unfunded liabilities. And the demand for its services has plunged. Mail volume went down 25% a decade ago, and it shows no sign of how exactly it's going to pay down those massive obligations it's legally required to pay, it's not at all clear. If you're not making profits each year, you won't have money to pay for those obligations to reduce your debt load. This is financial situation for postal service is very bad news for the agency itself, for Congress, and for America. Nobody wants us to get in a situation where the postal service goes broke requires a massive taxpayer bailout. And were the agency to shut down due to lack of cash, I should say that about 10 years ago, we were actually rather close to that. They were down to like $500 million left in the bank, which is way less than what they needed to keep open for a full week. It would be hugely disruptive if the Postal Service was to have an interruption in service due to a cash flow problem. You'd have half a million postal workers going without wages. You have the world's largest postal system, which even in its contracted state, is moving 150 billion pieces of mail per year, or 412 million per day. Just dead in the water, that whole system. Magazine companies send out millions of copies every month. Mailers send out tens of millions of stuff every month. Retailers, prescription drug sellers, uh, shipping and airline companies, they all put stuff into the system. They all work with the Postal Service in one shape, or another, they would all be hit hard. Local governments, state governments, think about where you get your jury summonses from. Suddenly, boom, how are you gonna get people on juries if you ask them for it? So, very bad scenario, we want to avoid. Now, moving on to postal politics, which um, are really <coughs> difficult. I would have never imagined how hard they are, but they are. They have a lot of aspects, a lot of divisions in them, and those of who work on postal policy, those who have to respond to constituent and interest groups' demands, you're going to find yourself tugged in many directions. Um, so I want to highlight just some of those, just uh, in case you haven't encountered them yet, so you'll know that they're coming your way, because they'll come. The first is, I've noticed that there's this division uh, in America when it comes to postal policy over nostalgia versus change. There are a lot of folks in this country who hold in their hearts the image of a smiling uniform letter carrier, printing letters written by their friends and family, post offices, those are cute little buildings with the American flag out front. That's the image in their mind. They think of the Postal Service as a thing that's always there, you can always depend upon. And when you bring up the possibility of changes, changes in the speed of delivery, days of service, post office, anything like that, you're going to run into a reflexive anxiety or outright hostility. 
it's just one of those things there in part of politics is persuasion and it takes time to bring people around to accepting that sometimes what they imagine can't come to be in reality. Another divide out there is localism versus the Postal Service's self-funding mission. Any of you who gets a letter about the Postal Service threatening to close post office, a mail sorting facility, frequently you find language that is like, it's our post office. It's our mail sorting facility. These are our jobs that are being taken from us. It's a perfectly understandable perspective, but the truth of the matter is postal service is under a statutory mandate to create an efficient system of receiving, processing, and delivering the mail. And it has full rights way more rights than most government agencies to cite its facilities and develop its systems to get the job done as it deems fit. So that efficiency versus local demands for maintaining their facilities and services, et cetera, that's a perennial tension. Um, it's another weird divide. The uh, best I can characterize it is, is great agency versus hapless dinosaur. If you look at the polling about the Postal Service, what you find is that Americans generally give high marks to it. They like the Postal Service. Yet, there's this recurrent theme of like, oh, that place is awful. It's a government monopoly. The service is crummy, crummy. You know, there's the lazy unionized workers. You know, we've seen these sort of attitudes embodied in characters like Newman on Seinfeld, who's like a sort of a guy, or Cliff Clayman from the show Cheers back in the 80s. I don't know if I'm dating myself, but he was always at the bar. I mean, you've never seen me actually delivering the mail. Um, so when people come to approach you and talk to you about postal policy or writing to you or contacting you, you know, want to think, which tribe are they coming from? The people who just think it's a hapless dinosaur or the people who are like, I love this place, the postal service is great. Um, another divide? Uh, Old versus young. Fortunately, I can say that I'm kind of straddling in between there. Um, I grew up handwriting letters. My mother in Ohio, who no longer uses a computer, she gets photos of my family because I print them out and I mail them to her. Um, meanwhile, my nieces and nephews, they don't even use email. They just don't see the point of it. And real mail? Get it. They don't subscribe to paper magazines. They don't like mail. They use services you know, like catalog choice to actually screen mail from coming. They don't want paper arriving. They just generally seem to just like it. Um, their attitude is like, Uber can bring it to me. Roman can bring it to me. Why can you, why, why do I need like something jammed in my mailbox every day? They just didn't grow up with the system in the same way that I did, the previous generations did. Um, so that's a divide that's out there. City versus rural. Uh, endemic split in postal policy. Um, cities' high densities make them frequently profitable places for the Postal Service to serve. You know, a letter carrier could walk into a building, be in the lobby, and put mail in you know, 100 apartment mailboxes. <coughs> Very different than being around rural Nebraska and you're having to go miles between to deliver. What that means is that cities tend to be profitable for the Postal Service to work, and rural areas one is subsidizing the other because what we want and what we've long had is a system of flat rates, equalized service, et cetera, et cetera. But when times get financially tight, that model is harder and harder to do. And so whenever you get, we talk about reducing services or changing things, don't be surprised if the first places that get upset are the rural areas. Um, another divide, public funded versus private sector funded. Some folks in the US think that the Postal Service is funded by taxpayers, uh, or that they imagine that the money they put out to purchase stamps and send letters and postcards is what keeps the agency afloat. Um, they also tend to view themselves as the primary customer of the Postal Service. If you look at the numbers, where the money comes from, that's not actually true. Um, that's kind of a popular myth. Uh, postal Service doesn't get tax dollars through appropriations. Self-funded. And the great, great bulk of money that the Postal Service brings in in the form of revenues, it comes from not-for-profits, for-profit businesses, and government. Not you or I buying a postcard and dropping it into the mail stream. Finally, a more recent division that has opened up in 
in postal politics is mail versus parcels. Now, 10 years ago, the Postal Service had a very tiny parcel business. It was a, a couple few billion dollars a year out of their budget, which at that time was $75 billion a year. Small line of business. Not surprising, the Postal Service historically was set up as a means of communication, not as a shipping conduit. Mail, communication, written word, that was their primary duty. Well, the recession of 2008 comes along, massive economic calamity, and mail volume went down 25%. Uh, then you had e-commerce come along. <coughs> Up goes parcels. We're now in a peculiar situation where the Postal Service now has a almost $20 billion a year parcel business. $3 billion, $20 billion. And their revenue is the same, around $70, $75 billion a year. So the character of the Postal Service is shifting from a mail business primarily into much more of a mail and parcel business. Well, that's a change, and it certainly wasn't something that Congress set out and said, you guys should become this. Um, it just happened due to economics. And unsurprisingly, it's creating divisions. Some people think it's wonderful the Postal Service is getting deeper and deeper into parcels. And then there are those who will raise their hand and say, mm, by the way, do you know that there are a private shipping company, private logistics company, private delivery companies? There are all these other entities out there that have been out there some for 100 years and some more recent, like Uber Eats and Amazon um, version of Uber where they're delivering stuff themselves. How is this fair? How is it fair that a government entity can compete against the private sector for the parcel business? So there's that division. All of which is to say that postal politics are hyper pluralistic situation of very sharply competing so to wrap my two comments together, first about finances and politics, we really need fundamental postal reform for the 21st century. Um, we don't want postal service to go bankrupt. But postal politics make reform unbelievably difficult. And this has always been the case. There's only been one major postal reform law, 2006, since 1970. Um, it's hard work. Um, and Nonetheless, it's really important work. And so as you endure the various grumpy constituent mails and the meetings with various interest groups who come through your door, I hope uh, you keep your chin up and um, realize that we actually are doing something that's really important. Thank you. Next up, Dean Fisher. Thank you. Um, before I get into my comments, I'll just say I am such a always a very literal person. And when Nick invited me to this, it was presented as a 101 for postal staffers. Basically, you're just learning about the Postal Service. So while Kevin and Nick gave some more in-depth overviews, I put on my old hat as a postal staffer and thought about the cranky calls I would get and the letters I would be written. And I will present information to you at a very high level. But again, at the end, um, if you want to follow up with me later, always very happy to talk to you. I'll give you a little bit about my own background. I came to Washington, I almost said 10 years ago, it was 25 years ago, <laughs> to work for a South Dakota senator in his personal office. And I handled health care, but also got stuck with postal. Um, I was not happy about that, but I said I would do it. The legislative aides also served as the legislative correspondents, so nothing was ever happening on postal except I would get mail, sometimes from small local newspapers who were unhappy with the service they were getting from the postal service, as far as when their mail would be delivered to newspapers, or from people who were worried about getting their checks in the mail, something was lost or was delayed. Um, I did that job until my boss lost, then I went on and took a job on the, it was at the time the Governmental Affairs Committee. It's now the Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. And I worked to work for Senator Cochran. And I was his postal and civil service person, his expert on those issues. And then I started to learn a lot more about the world of the postal service. Um, but again, not a tremendous amount going on. Uh, worked there for Senator Cochran for a while. 
then actually ended up going over to the Postal Service and worked in government relations for a few years, learned a lot more about postal operations, more than I wanted, came back <laughs> to the Hill to work again for Senator Cochran. And then when I was about ready to leave the Hill again, uh, Senator Collins had become the new chair of the Government Affairs Committee, and she was very interested in introducing a postal reform bill. And she was looking for a Republican staffer who might be able to help her. And since there was about one of us <laughs> <laughs> on Capitol Hill, on the Senate side, uh, they did reach out to me, and I uh, really liked Senator Collins, was excited to come work for her, and did. And though I thought it was going to absolutely kill me, um, and she said it was her most difficult legislative experience ever. We did get the postal reform bill passed that Kevin alluded to. And that was uh, considering other major, major pieces of legislation that the senator had worked on that at that time. And you'll wonder what the heck made it so difficult. You will find out if a big postal reform bill ever moves again. People that you would never imagine care about the post office in your state will be ringing you up. Uh, a lot of businesses primarily who still utilize the mail, though again, it's 2019, it's not 2006. The business's use of the mail is dramatically different. We heard a lot from members of the newspaper industry. We heard a lot from representatives of UPS who have their own package industry, but at the same time, work together with the Postal Service to help them, uh, to help UPS get some of their packages to that last mile. They call it the very remote parts of the, the country that the Postal Service goes to every day anyway. Um, Amazon wasn't uh, a postal player at that time, um, not a big one at least. They are now, I wish they'd been around then. They would have been a very interesting voice in the whole debate. But uh, basically, you'll hear from a lot of people that you've never heard from before. So it, it will get much more interesting. So did that. It didn't kill me. Um, I was brought over then to the Postal Regulatory Commission, which was, it had been the Postal Rate Commission. And I'll tell you a little bit about the Postal Rate Commission if this is the first time you've ever heard about it, which for a lot of people I meet with on the Hill, it usually is. Uh, but I went over there and I've been there since uh, for 12 years. First, I worked as the incoming chairman's chief of staff and now I do that uh, public affairs and government relations. So I'm um, happy to not work on the Hill anymore, but I love to come up and visit with the staff and be as helpful as I can from my office downtown. But the commission, for those of you who are hearing it, hearing about it for the first time, has been in place since 1970. And that was when Congress changed the post office department into the postal service. Congress, if you can imagine what a nightmare this would have been, used to approve all the rate increases of the postal service. And members of Congress also got very engaged in appointing local postmasters. Uh, there came a point where they decided they didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, the the rate-setting part, I can especially see. I mean, that's just spreadsheets filled with rates, uh, more rates than you could ever imagine. <coughs> um, and created the Postal Regulatory, excuse me, Postal Rate Commission. And so we've been in existence since 1970. We're super small then, I'm guessing about 30 people. Um, now we're 75 people. A lot of the staff are economists or accountants. Um, many are lawyers as well. I would say, most would say, our specialty is rate setting. And as a regulator, our <coughs> primary job is making sure that the Postal Service stays in compliance with the law, especially uh, in, in particular the updated Postal Reform Law that was passed in 2006, which specifies how rates are to be set for two different buckets of products. One is the market dominant products. Those are primarily the monopoly mail, mail products. Those with the captive customer or the periodicals are also in there. And then uh, the other bucket is their competitive products. And that's anything that you're paying extra for to move at a faster speed, like priority mail or their express mail products. 
Postal Service has a lot of latitude for how they price their competitive products. We just, again, look at the law, make sure they're following the requirements of the law, ensure there's no cross-subsidization going on, ensure that that pot of competitive products collectively covers a fair share of the overhead institutional costs of the Postal Service. And then when it comes to the market dominant products, part of what the 2006 Act did was mailers were frustrated with the inconsistency of rate increases. Every, I don't know if you'll remember this, um, it, sometimes the Postal Service could go for three or four years without increasing rates and then jack them way up by a nickel. And businesses didn't like that, who were very reliant on the Postal Service. They would see then what they had to pay, let's say Time Inc., I remember at the time, uh, was very engaged. And that was a, a big expense for them that they weren't anticipating. What they wanted to see out of the 2006 Act was annual rate increases, more predictable, held in line with some marker. And so what the 2006 Act came up with, and this was a agreed agreement reached upon with the Postal Service and uh, members of the Bush administration at the time, was to link market dominant price increases to the CPI. I'll go back to that issue in a little bit because we have an issue pending before the commission that some of your constituents might down the road care about. So rates is a, a big thing that we do. Um, you know, when I put together my remarks, I was thinking about what do we do that you may actually hear from people about. You, most of the stuff you'll hear from constituents about will not need to come to the Postal Regulatory Commission. Most of your issues will be, um, I got, uh, my mail showed up late. I got my neighbor's mail, they got mine. Um, my postman uh, was surly with me. Um, my mail doesn't come on time. Why does it take a letter to my mom 10 days to go from here to Wyoming? It used to take four. Something like that. And I imagine that's a lot of what you're getting. Or uh, workforce type APWU related complaints. Um, anything that has to do with the labor force has nothing to do with us. Uh, that's purely under the purview of the Postal Service. Another area that we might get into is post office closings. The <coughs> Postal Service hasn't closed post office as much. There was a time where they were more rapidly trying to shrink their network. Um, they've moved away from closing post offices and more changed their hours or shrink the hours that they're open. But there was a while where they had a plan to potentially close thousands of post offices across the country. Nations were losing, not nations, uh, towns were losing their minds. And we were hearing from a lot of congressional offices very upset about this. Communities have the right to appeal a post office closing. I wish that the word appeal wasn't used because what that appeal really is, is you can, they can write an appeal to the commission, the Postal Service's determination to close the post office. What we do in reviewing the appeal is just look back at the Postal Service's extensive regulations and make sure that they did everything they're supposed to do. And if they have, the, the appeal is dismissed. We don't have the authority to overturn a postal decision to close a post office. So I, it's always bothered me a little bit because I have to deal with the staff when it calls and hopes that this appeal might end up in a post office being reopened, but we just revisit and make sure the Postal Service is following the law. Uh, another area of interest, and I actually got involved quite a bit with some rural state senators over the past few years the charge was sort of led by former Senator Heitkamp from North Dakota. Um, she had some members from Montana and Wyoming, Missouri involved. They were very dismayed at the extreme slowdown in mail in especially rural parts of the country. And again, a lot of what that can stem from is the Postal Service is slowly but surely shrinking its network. And with that comes plant consolidations. And that means your mail may not go to the same nearby plant for processing that it once went to. It may go along a more circuitous path, meaning it will take longer time to get to your home. 
But what uh, Senator Heitkamp wanted to see was just more transparency on the process. Uh, she wanted people to be able to know uh, how long it was going to take and felt that that information wasn't readily transparent or that it was sort of being hidden. Um, and so that was what we worked with. It, it, it's not up to us how, how quickly this moves, but we do monitor the Postal Service's movement of the mail. In 2006, that was another thing that the bill did was require the Postal Service to, for the first time to establish service standards. And what that specifically applies to is how quickly any piece of mail moves from point A to point B. You know you're paying to get more rapid treatment if it's priority mail or express <coughs> mail. But the other mail, um, that has seen a bit of a decline in how rapidly it's moving. And we work with the Postal Service on improving their methods for tracking the movement of the mail. And we issue reports on how well they're doing in meeting their service goals for the different areas of mail. Uh, let's see. The issue I was going to bring up that's currently pending is in 2006, when we passed the law, we created a new way to calculate rates for market dominant products. And we placed them all in different basket, baskets according to mail class type, but all subject to a CPI cap. And so right now, the Postal Service has the authority, and they do it annually, to increase rates for the different classes of market dominant mail, on average, no more than for each class CPI. Well, the law required that 10 years after enactment, we look at that whole system for how rates are calculated for market dominant mail, determine is this working the way that Congress intended the rate system to work or is it not? The commission determined that it, taking into account all these different factors and objectives, no, at base it was not working the way Congress intended. Personally, um, it's not a surprise, it's 10 years later. <laughs> the economy has changed dramatically. Um, so the commission has the job of recommending a new rate setting system, uh, taking a lot of input from uh, the community at large, primarily <coughs> mailers, uh, users, big users of the mail, um, competitors. The commissioners, there are five of them, political appointees. Uh, for a long time we just had four, we finally had a fifth seat filled. They need to come to agreement on how that system should be changed. That takes some time. Um, I am hopeful that soon the commission will put out, we, we issued an initial proposal, took feedback on that. The commissioners are looking at the issues that some were less than happy with and potentially making modifications to release a second proposal. Our general counsel would probably kill me for the way I'm sort of gargling the way I'm discussing this, but considering the fact that I'm just a public affairs person, basically we'll have a new proposal at some point. I can't say exactly when, but I would hope something is out this year. Uh, and that you will probably hear from your constituents on. They will have businesses, uh, consumers will have input or groups will tell them they should have input on what happens to those rates. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I would say for the most part, that would be it. There was also a case a number of years ago, the law does require that if the Postal Service wants to make a nationwide change in service that would impact the country as a whole, they must come forward to the commission with that case and basically present us their plan and then we more or less shoot holes in their plan and send them back and they perfect it and then they go forward with it. There was uh, a time a few years ago where they did have a series of proposals that came to us. One big <coughs> one that was, um, it's interesting, the general public when they are polled doesn't seem to care whether the Postal Service delivers five or six days a week, but boy did Congress care. <laughs> they did not like that idea at all. 
Uh, we reviewed that proposal, and again, we basically look at where we believe the pro proposal may have holes in it and say, this needs more research, this needs more research, this is what we determine to be the amount of costs you would save, and then we send it back with them um, for further effort, and then they, they put it forth. It was rejected by Congress. Uh, the other one was also the item I mentioned before, which was their plan to close down thousands of post offices across the nation. <coughs> they didn't end up doing that. They revised that proposal and instead modified the hours of those post offices, which was much more palatable. But that, again, it's been a while. If there's ever um, a situation, again, where the Postal Service wants to make some sort of service change that impacts the whole nation, you would probably hear from your constituents, and that, again, is when you could weigh in with us. I am, like I said, uh, the head of public affairs at the Postal Service. A lot of people find their way to us, though the Lord, not really the ones that can help them, but I do have a list right next to my phone of all the congressional affairs staffers at the Postal Service who handle your specific state, and if, you, if they haven't reached out to you, they've got a big government relations department um, there is someone state specific for every member and uh, if they haven't introduced themselves to you look up the phone number of Postal Service headquarters they've got a, a full letter writing department there to craft you with help you craft constituent responses it's very robust um, we can help you uh, on any other issue that sort of falls under our purview but uh, other than that uh, our website is www.prc.gov check us out sometime and if you ever you know need me to steer you into the direction of something I'm happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and let's open up for questions. Um, anything that you're that or anything that's been weighing on your mind. What, yep. Okay, well I'll start and ask um, for the benefit of any staffers who have not yet gotten a courtesy call from a representative of a postal union or a nonprofit mailer. Um, can you just give a little introduction to the landscape and what the kind of things that um, they care about? I mean, if you were like having a cup of coffee with one of the staffers here and they said, you know, I got five minutes, can you prep me on, or one minute, can you prep me on, this group's going to come and call and I got to meet them. Yeah, so there are four major postal unions, uh, and their interests are distinct, national, so to speak. 